now that we have character tables and we can uh, reduce down representations to a linear combination of irreducible spread representations, we can now apply this towards treating things like molecular motion. So in class, remember, we treated the three degrees of freedom for each atom because I mentioned that every atom can move independently, even though they are bonded. So then when you have a polyatomic molecule, so we have three atoms here, uh, you're always going to have 3n uh, you know, degrees of motion. Motion. And then so you're going to have, so n is the number of atoms. So if I had four atoms, you know, it could have 12. And then so you end up building up these 12 by 12, 15 by 15, huge matrices. So that's why using the irreducible representations is going to be a lot easier. So from class, we said that um, if you're treating these three x, y, and z for each atom, uh, the way you can derive your reducible representation for this 9 by 9, I'll just kind of briefly go over this, is if your vector is unchanged, then you get a plus 1 under that character. Uh, so for example, for this z1 on the oxygen atom, when we did a c2, it was, you rotate about, it's unchanged. Right? So it's going to be a 1. Um, if you did a sigma v along the xz, it's also unchanged, so it's, it's a plus 1. So this z axis on the oxygen is unchanged throughout, but this z axis for this hydrogen, when you do a C2, flips over. So if it moves, if it moves, position. So if you're on an atom that moves, it's going to be a 0. Because remember, the coordinate systems corresponding to the hydrogen atoms, uh, when you rotate or when you, they move position, they're no longer blocked out. So you have these off diagonal blocks. So that's, that's why it's a 0 for the trace of the character. <coughs> And if it doesn't change position, but if it reverses sign or it reverses direction, direction, it's going to be a minus 1. So for example, here we're talking about the x1 or the y1 uh, vectors for the oxygen atom. So when you do a c2, they don't change position because they're still on the oxygen atom. But they've now switched direction. So x1 becomes negative x1, y1 becomes minus y1. So that's why they become negative 1 for the character there. So uh, from there, we were able to treat all nine of these, this nine by one vector, and we were able to uh, then sum them up to form our reduced representation. So if you remember, we got something like gamma 3n equals, uh, let me make sure I've got this right, it was 9 minus 1, 3, 1. I had it written down somewhere. Yeah, so 9 because we have nine things, and then this Minus 1 is because uh, we're talking about the C2, so we're only looking at this oxygen atom. So the Z stays the same, but the X and Y both become minus 1. So then they sum up to minus 1. So 1 minus 2 is minus 1. And then we have 3 and then 1. And then we're able to show that this equals, when we reduce this down in class, we show that this equals 3A1, sorry, I have it written down here, <coughs> 3A1 plus A2 plus 3 B2 plus, oh sorry, B1. 3 B1 plus 2 B2. So basically, this, so this is gamma 3 N. So this is our, all our degrees of motion. So, but one thing to keep in mind is that these, uh, I guess, molecular motion modes also encompass uh, the motion of the entire molecule. So it includes three degrees of translation for the whole molecule. So you imagine we're talking about all three atoms are going, moving up in the z direction together, and that's a translation in the z direction. So we have to think about um, translation and rotation of the molecule. So those would not count as vibration. So what I'm saying is gamma 3n is going to be a sum of a reduced representation corresponding to vibration, as well as a reduced representation corresponding to translation, and then also a representation corresponding to rotation. And I, we can actually know what they are from our character table up here. So we know that motion in the x, z, and y direction correspond to b1, b2 for y, and a1 for z. So we can actually look at 
all our degrees of motion, and then we can then uh, subtract out uh, representations corresponding to that. So we know that, let's see, one of our B1s is going to be X translation, one of our B2s is going to be Y translation, and one of our A1s is going to be Z translation. And then rotation, we also have three rotational modes. So if you imagine we could rotate molecule about this Z axis, we rotate about the Y axis or the X axis also. So we need to subtract out modes corresponding to RX, RY, and RZ. So we'll take out another one of our B2s. So this B2 is gone. And then we'll take out a B1. And then we'll take out an A2. So that's goodbye. So what this means is after I've subtracted it out, if you can read through all the scribbles, we'll know that gamma vibration is going to be equal to 2A1 plus B1. And then so I'll point out we have only three vibrational modes for water. So whenever you're looking at a polyatomic molecule, so sorry, uh, sorry a nonlinear molecule, molecule, you have 3n minus 6 vibrations. So again, 3n is because every atom can move in three directions, minus 6 because we're losing 3 each or for the translation and the rotation. And what's left is how many vibrations you have. So because this was a three atom molecule, it's 9 minus 6 is 3 for water. If we have a linear molecule, we lose one degree of rotation. Uh, so your vibrational modes would be 3n minus 5. And then so uh, in the next video, we'll talk about how we can start visualizing what these look like using group theory.